hour seven, so good evening everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq in the district of Sabaganagadi, the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'm Eleanor Rolston, the warden for the municipality of East Hans, and I see fellow council member Carl McPhee is here, and we're also joined by our CAO, Kim Ramsey, our director of planning, John Woodford, and our Director of Finance, uh, Corporate Services, not just Finance, finance. Uh, Wade <laughs> Don't add anything, please. <laughs> <laughs> Wade, you're two, five days now, so yeah. Yeah. he's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome, Wade. I'm learning, too. <laughs> He'll be doing the presentation tonight. <laughs> uh, so we're very pleased to be able to host you this evening and share with you our municipal budget information for 2023-2024. <laughs> And although important, <coughs> municipal budgets are more than just property assessments and tax rates. The budget represents the work that we will be doing to further our strategic objectives over the coming year. Uh, we have several infrastructure projects and other initiatives that are aimed at making our communities places that people like you are happy to call home. This evening you will hear about many initiatives that focus on our growth center of Elmsdale and the surrounding areas. We also have projects in Mount Uniac and rural East Hands aimed at strengthening our communities. I can assure you that Council is committed to growing the rural and suburban areas of the municipality and will take any opportunities that arise to capitalize on improving any part of East Hands. In the past number of years, we have made significant investments in our two business parks, local sport infrastructure, Burncoat Head, Park, the Fundy Tidal Interpretive Center, and the growth of tourism along the 214 from Shubenacadie to Walton. Our commitment to growing East Hants in a fiscally responsible manner while managing the expectations of our existing constituents is important to me as warden and to council as a whole. Our CAO, Kim Ramsey, will be taking you through our budget and business plan, providing you with updates on current and future initiatives, and as well, she'll share with you some of the larger developments that have been approved or are in the queue for consideration and what that means for our population and our growth. And we'll also ensure that we have enough time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions you might have. So I'd just like to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedules to come out tonight and for being engaged in your community. So thank you for coming and over to you, Kim. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm Kim Ramsey, I'm the CAO of the municipality. I know quite a few people in the room. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've lived here since 2000 in East Hans. I was an import from New Brunswick. Uh, started with the municipality in 2000 as manager of finance and I'm now um, CAO. I think more importantly, I've raised three kids in East Hans. Um, I have a 19 year old, a 17 year old, and a 12 year old. So I guess I'm still raising three kids in these hands. Um, and I love the community that we live in. And I'm very fortunate to work for the municipality. I think it's, it's a wonderful community from the shore, Mount Uniac, through to the corridor. Um, and I'm pleased. I know there's some new people to the community that are here, uh, some that have lived here forever and ever. Um, so to me, it's, it's one of the best places that you could possibly live. It's right outside of Halifax. Halifax has all kinds of amenities that we get to use and don't have to pay for uh, from a tax perspective. Um, but we have a place that feels like home when we come out past the airport and you kind of get that East Hans feeling. So uh, when we look at East Hans, we look at, um, typically we're talking about tax and budgets. We have three very distinct areas in East Hans that form part of the entire community. So we have, this is what I'll refer to as sort of the rural East Hans, the shore and the central area. Then we have two large electoral districts in Uniac and Rodden. And then the corridor, Shubenacadie, Maitland, up towards Maitland, um, that's what we refer to as the corridor. Um, and you'll hear us talk a lot about growth in the corridor over the next um, little while. And that is just sort of that natural growth that's coming out from Halifax and making its way along that 102 corridor. Um, you know, we're not the only ones experiencing the growth. You look at places like Stuyak and Truro, 
and um, the entire province really, but this is really the big focus um, at the provincial level too of, of where that growth is going to come from. The provincial government has stated that they want to double the population of Nova Scotia in the next several years. Um, where are those people going to go? <laughs> we already have about a 50,000 unit housing shortage, so um, there's going to be a lot of pressure to sort of grow, and most of those folks are going to want to come into Halifax, and then most of the people in Halifax are going to say enough of this, and they're going to want to come up this way. <laughs> so that's what we're planning for, um, and you'll see some of the developments. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on them if you have sort of more in-depth questions about them. Our director of planning is here. Um, he can help answer any of those questions. So as far as the businesses in these tents, um, this is data that came in 2021. Just to give you an idea of where our sectors are, because a lot of what our economic and business development team does is look at sectors and workforce development. And this is what, this is the data that we use to sort of focus our attentions. So most of our um, industries are around the construction industry. We, the next one would be retail trade, then we look at others, so that kind of captures a lot of little things. Um, but then you look into sort of that healthcare, social assistance, agricultural, forestry, fishing, those types of things. Those are the next sort of big level of industry that we, that we have. I know there's at least one other accountant in the room, two other accountants in the room. I'm not going to talk a lot about numbers tonight, just so you know. Um, what I'm going to focus on tonight is what we're doing as a municipal government to make this happen. So we have, every time we have a new council, every four years, we get a new strategic plan, and that new council will set sort of the guidance for us as, a, as municipal staff to implement that plan over the next four years. So the current mission and vision are up here. Um, really focusing on providing service excellence, making sure we stands as a place where people can come and get good service. Um, they feel like they belong in the community, they have good quality of life in the community, um, and making sure that we don't just focus on urban or rural, we're focusing on the entire community and making it a place that people can do business, live, raise their kids, and be really happy about it. So if you wanted to look at our entire strategic plan, uh, it's only about six or seven pages. Um, you can get all of this information on our municipal website. So in the plan, there's four key strategies that we're going to touch on different initiatives that we have. One is sustainable infrastructure. So when we talk about growth in East Hans and, and all the development that we're going to look at, we need sustainable infrastructure for that. And that is anything that connects people, connects water, sewer, all of those things. We also have um, a key strategy around corporate excellence. So that is really uh, my job is to make sure that anybody who interacts with the municipality gets really great service and can trust the public government that they have. So that is really all of the internal work that we do as an organization to make it a place that you want to walk through the doors and feel comfortable as a resident. Um, you might not always get the answer you want when you come in the door, but you're going to get it in a way that's respectful and kind and uh, with empathy and all of those things that you look for in, in your government. We also have around strong community and economic prosperity. So strong community really is making sure that the community base is what is needed to make people feel all the feelings that we want them to feel. Um, and economic prosperity is really working with our local businesses, working with our other levels of government to make sure that we can provide the support that's needed, get more commercial assessment, more jobs, and all the spin-offs that come with economic development in your community. You can't just build homes. You need to be able to build businesses and support um, that, that the people living in those homes can work at. So our overall strategy, we'll get into a little bit more in a bit. I did want to talk a little bit, like you can't talk about what we do without talking a little bit about the budget. So our operating budget is 41.9 million. Of that, commercial taxes are 4.3 million. The capital budget we have right now is $65 million. Um, that includes this building, because we haven't closed off the project yet. There's still about $50,000 to close out, so it still forms part of that larger number. 
And then our water utility budget is about $3 million. So of the operating budget, we get about $34 million from various taxes, which is fairly high because we don't get any other levels of government support in these hands. Um, a lot of municipalities will get several million dollars worth of what they call equalization payments. And um, because we're in a good position financially, we're in a good position geographically, our assessments are good, um, we don't qualify for, for equalization. And that's been the case for about 23 years now, um, which we've come to terms with. Um, but when they do things we like... We don't agree with the way they figure it out. <laughs> we don't agree with it, but um, when they do things like they did last year and double the equalization payments to municipalities, we do kind of make a little bit of a mistake because Two double of nothing is nothing. So we did make a little bit of a stink last year, and this year, instead of doubling the equalization payments, they gave growth grants to municipalities. So we just got $1.1 .1 million um, in, a, in a growth grant to go towards some of the infrastructure that you need to grow your community. So we do advocate for more um, financial investment from the provincial government. Sometimes we get it, and sometimes we don't, but we're appreciative of everything we get. So in these budgets, of course, like all of your budgets, we're seeing increases across the board in insurance and um, power, um, fuel costs, all of those things are impacting our municipal budgets quite significantly. Um, you know, the, the power to run one pump in the lift station can be tens of thousands of dollars a year. Um, it's kind of mind blowing to think of that when all you're really doing is pumping poo up a hill but um, those are the real costs that we face, and when power goes up by 9%, those tens of thousands of dollars become tens of thousands more. So we do, um, we do monitor our budgets and manage them um, fairly well, I believe, um, but we are not immune to rising costs and um, things in the economy, for sure. So part of our budget um, is assessments, of your homes and your businesses, and the other part would be their tax rates. So we're gonna talk a little bit about both of those fairly quickly. East Hands is really fortunate. Um, this year we've seen about 15% growth in both our commercial and our residential tax assessments. 50% um, of both of those is because of new bills. So typically we would see maybe 8% growth in our assessments, and you know, maybe three or 4% of that would be new bills. Um, we've seen 15% and half of that is new investment in our community through homes or businesses being built. So that's excellent. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to point out here is sort of some, some of your taxable assessment types. Because municipalities really only have, we have tax rates that we can charge, and then we have some fees for service that we can charge. So when you come into this building, for example, you pay for your child's swimming lessons, you pay for your lap swim, those are fee for service. Um, we don't really have a lot of pools to charge from. We are, we are bound by the Municipal Government Act, which is provincial legislation, to say what we can and cannot charge, not for things, but for. So services that we're allowed to give to residents and charge them for, we have very little control over that. Um, some of the things that aren't mentioned on this slide, we have things like, um, we have area rates that people pay. So for folks who live in Mount Uniac, don't pay for the sidewalks in Elmsdale, for example. So we have an area rate in Elmsdale to pay for those sidewalks and only the people in the corridor pay for corridor sidewalks. So people are making like a lot of money in Elmsdale? <laughs> <laughs> don't lock the door. <laughs> they just don't pay for them. Um, so, area rates that we charge, we've got about $1.6 million in area rates on top of these taxes. We also have a wastewater management fee, which used to be charged through an area rate uh, for your wastewater services for anyone who's on the sewer system. We used to charge those on the area rates. Now we charge them based on how much water your home consumes. Um, and the reason for that was before um, a $5 million business, for example, with one toilet got charged based on their $5 million assessment. And really they didn't impact the wastewater system at all. 
Um, you could argue the same if there was an older couple who lived in a $700,000 house. They might go to pee five times a day versus four teenagers, showers, toilets, and all that in a $200,000 house. So they might have paid $200 for sewer and the other folks would be paying you know, six or $700 for sewer. So moving into the wastewater system or the, the water bill, we did it very um, gradually and now it's fully charged through that water bill. That's about $1.2 million. Uh, we also charge folks in the corridor area for the sports bikes. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, it's just under $600,000. We budget for detransfer tax, so anyone who sells a home in East Hans pays a detransfer tax. Um, the budget for that is about 1.8 million. The last couple of years, that has hit three million dollars every day of the week. So I'm not sure what the budget will look like for that in the future. We keep saying, well, we can't count on it. We can't count on it, but we keep mm -hmm. getting it. So uh, what council has done is um, taken any additional detransfer tax and used it for either new RCMP services or they've set it aside for specific purposes where they could. So, um, We also have a waste dwelling unit fee, so everybody pays $220 for, for waste for every dwelling unit they own. Um, that brings in about $2.4 million and it goes directly to cover the waste management services that we have um, here in East Hans. So the, Garbage collection, pro we have to transport our waste um, outside of East Hans to be processed. We pay for it to be processed. And we also have our waste management center for construction debris and for, um, for transferring. So all the garbage goes into there, and then it gets put on bigger trucks and gets taken out. So it's not, not for the faint of heart. Um, I wanted to put a slide in here about the assessment cap because I don't think you can talk about assessments without talking about the assessment cap. Um, and there's only one slide board, so don't worry. <laughs> I tend to go on a diatribe about assessment cap, but I'll stick to this one slide. So when you look at the $41 million budget that East Hans has and needs to provide the services that we do, we have to take the assessments we have, the capped assessments that we have, and figure out what the tax rate needs to be to pay for those services. If we were billing on market assessment, which is the market value of your home, which is what anyone who just bought a house here is paying on market assessment, essentially, because you don't, you come into the cap once you buy your home, but you pay on your new, on the, the higher assessment. Our tax rate, if we could bill on market, would be 19 cents lower than it is right now, because we have a bigger pool of assessment to bill on. What essentially happens when we have to have an 81 cent tax rate instead of a 69 or 62 cent tax rate is the folks who, so this is a, this is a duplex on, um, in Elwood subdivision. Both sides obviously were built at the same time. Their market assessments are exactly the same. This person's cap assessment is $157,000 because when the cap program came into effect, their assessment was probably around $130,000 and it's only gone up by CPI every year. This person bought their house in 2021, so their cap assessment is $213,000 because it automatically reverts back to market. What ends up happening is this person is saving $245 under the cap program that person is paying $235 more under the CAP program than they would if it wasn't here. And this is a provincial program that basically says your assessments can't go up by more than CPI every year. They get the same services, they have the same access to everything, they share a center wall, but this person pays $480 less than their neighbor. Is it right, is it wrong? I'll leave you guys to decide that. Um, East Hans has been a proponent of phasing the tax or the cap assessment program out over 10 or 15 years. So it kind of, you get out of the program over a long, slow uh, phase out. Um, we made some headway with the uh, former Liberal government. They had formed an all-party committee to look at it. We were almost there and then we had an election and 
we haven't talked about it since. So this is the CAP program. There's lots of examples where people who live in um, like a $360,000 house market, they're capped at 320, they think they're winning in that situation, and they're actually paying like $150 more in tax than they would otherwise, because that tax rate would be lower. And there's an assumption that the cap saves everybody money. It doesn't. Right. It saves some people money. But if the tax rate was 19 cents less than what it was, and you paid on your full assessment, sometimes you'd be paying less than you would be paying the current tax rate on the cap to say. So when I was in finance, I used to have people that would say, no, 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 that's not possible. I'm, I'm definitely saving because I've got a $40,000 difference in my cap. And I would say, give me a call to the office, and I will do the math for you. And inevitably, they would pay more in tax than they would otherwise be. So it, there is an educational need that we need to educate the public on what the CAP program is actually doing. Yes, the problem is that some people are paying less than they would otherwise. Um, but it's to the detriment <coughs> of typically lower income families because their houses aren't assessed as high and don't go up by CPI every year. Um, typically to new homeowners and the young folks that are trying to get ahead and I don't know who anyone who can buy a home now, starter homes or $450,000, but um, that's generally who, who is to the detriment of. So that's my spiel on cap. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'll leave it to you. Um, so dwelling units in East Hans, you've all seen it. Uh, look around. Uh, John and his team work with developers every day to who are here to build uh, more dwelling units. I personally think it's wonderful. Everyone has their own opinion. Um, the 10 years ago, this number would have been about 60 to 90 units every year consistently. Last year, we had 422 units added to the roll, which 308 of them in the corridor, and then the split between rural and Mount Uniac. Um, and we had $146 million in new construction on residential new construction last year. So of the 300 million that our assessment base grew, half of that was the new construction from these dwelling units. And again, building permits, we've seen the same sort of phenomenon. Uh, we have hired three, two new building inspectors in the last mm -hmm. two. two. We've added two new building inspectors to our complement that was two. Um, <laughs> so again, you can see the history of two building inspectors were doing kind of a couple hundred permits a year. And now um, we have two new positions. We've only filled one. Um, and we're doing 472. So our fire inspector has been sort of pulling double duty and doing some building inspections. We've brought back one of our retired building inspectors as much as we can to do some of the smaller permits and get those out of the way. Um, so you know anyone who's a building inspector who's looking for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give me a call. You send, John, send them John's way. Um, we did have someone who was almost ready to come, uh, but he wanted to start date of 2025. Uh, first time for me, but that's a little weird. Um, anyway, if you know anyone who is or wants to be trained as a building inspector, ideally who is, um, send them our way. That's your plug, John. Uh, so looking at commercial growth in um, some of these things, as I mentioned them, you'll kind of go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Looking at District 1, this is your Enfield District, so that would be the new auto center um, on the number 2 down by the Magnolia area. Um, the new dentist in, in Enfield, and then some uh, significant growth in Elmsdale Lumber. The 7.6 million in Elmsdale District 2, um, 5.6 of that is actually from this business park. So about 2.5 million from the new loop that was constructed, uh, some of the new buildings up there and then uh, growth in and around the park. Um, district number three is the work, some of the work that's being done in the Milford Industrial Park. Uh, number four is in Shubenacadie. So there's some work going on around exit 10. There's some new buildings um, up around exit 10. So those are sort of driving that growth. Um, let me see what else is big there. Number eight is um, the Mount Muniac Business Park. So we have a new section opened in the Mount Muniac, Mount Muniac Business Park. Um, about 2.3 million of that 
um, 3.1 million is, is new growth, and then sort of that sort of just normal growth of business um, is the rest of it. So yeah, there's lots of lots of activity. So these are the numbers of the full 21 million. What happened, as I said, was new construction, uh, which is phenomenal. Like it's a phenomenal story for East Hands to have that much new commercial construction. Um, we just haven't seen that level of construction for, for a long time. Uh, just a little uh, plug in here for PVSC. So I would encourage everybody when you get your property assessments to look at them. Uh, they form half of your tax bill, so they're half of the equation. If you don't think that your house is assessed properly, give them a call. Ask them some questions. Find out what kind of, um, I'll say elements they have for your house. Um, before you appeal your assessment, because you could call and find out that they don't in fact know your basement is finished, and they don't in fact know that you have three bathrooms, and so just caution you on just calling them randomly out to, to appeal. Um, I've talked to many people who didn't like it once they left. Um, so yeah, this year we saw CPI rates of 7.7%, which is huge. Um, in response to that, you'll see that your assessment may have gone up, but your um, tax rates have gone down because council recognizes that it's not just your, we just can't bill on all the new assessment we get and, and we only need a certain amount of money and that's what they're gonna, gonna do their budgets on. So this is sort of the, the, the tax burden calculation. So council doesn't just look at tax rates. A lot of councils will say, well, we've lowered our tax rate by one cent, but they're getting you know, an extra $5 million because the assessments all went up so significantly. So yes, you have to do your assessment times your tax rate to get your taxes. Then you take those taxes, you add your waste management fee um, if you, uh, for, for garbage collection and whatnot. And then you have to add your waste water management fee from your water bill. And that is your total tax burden. So that's what council looks at when they're looking at the budget. It's not just the tax rate. They look at what is the average homeowner paying more this year for all the services they're gonna get. And they try and keep that number at a reasonable amount. So this year for tax rates, uh, we did reduce the residential tax rate um, to 81 cents from 85 cents. Um, again, the envy of every municipal unit in the province because very few of us are able to lower our tax rate and deal with the growth that we're having. So that's lowering your tax rate after we've added some new positions to deal with the <coughs> growth, after we've added costs for our CMP and education, and we'll talk about some of those big, big numbers in a little bit. So uh, lots of my counterparts are, they haven't even set their budgets yet. Um, ours is set in February. They haven't set theirs yet because they don't know what to do, because they don't want to raise taxes, but they're kind of stuck in a, in a laundry. And then the commercial tax rate uh, was reduced this year by three cents, from two dollars and fifty cents down to, uh, or sorry, from two fifty nine, two sixty down to two fifty seven. And this is just sort of a, a view of how those rates have come down over the years. Again, up here is a little bit misleading for the Elmsdale All In because we were still transferring over to the waste water fee. So those tax rates were coming down as the wastewater fee was going up, the tax rates could come down. And again, just caution, when you're looking at tax rates and comparing, you need to look at everything. You need to look at that total tax burden between here and Halifax or here in Truro. Um, I know a lot of people talk to their neighbors and, or you know, I just moved from Truro, my taxes here are 10 times as high or 10, you know, there's, not here, of course. Right. <laughs> um, but, but they're not, you know, might say, oh, my taxes are so much lower here. Well, you're not calculating in that you're paying $200 a month on your, or a quarter on your water bill for wastewater, and that's billed by the town and turnover. You know, you just have to be aware of what mm -hmm. comparisons you're making. And again, that residential tax rate coming down is sort of one of our council's priorities. Uh, we do have urban, uh, area rates, I want to talk about a few of them. The urban service rate is what I was talking about between sort of the corridor, so up in Enfield where the system, where the sewer and water systems start, <coughs> down to Shubenacadie where they end. 
Um, all of those people pay some element of the urban service rate. And that covers your, um, you get your wastewater management fee. In Milford, they pay for sewer on, um, on this rate because they don't have a water bill. So they pay taxes still um, on, in Milford for their sewer. Um, street lights, sidewalks, hydrants. We take that money and we pay it to the water utility as a, as a fee to keep water flowing into the hydrants. And we do have some peripheral communities that pay like a one or two cent rate into this fee because they do come in and use the sidewalks and whatnot. And that was just council's way of the day um, of making sure people who were using them paid for them. And then you have individual street lights in Rodden, Mount Uniac, Enfield Grand Lake, and Nine Mile River and Valdan. So those areas have their own independent street light rate. Um, so all your expenses and your revenues go into one little pot on its own. We have fire levies that everybody across the municipality pays. Um, the um, rural folks pay a little bit more in fire levies. It's five cents more generally. Um, and that's to account for the lower assessments because the departments still need the funds to run. They just have a lower assessment base to charge on. So they have a higher tax rate back to that tax times assessment. Uh, Sportsplex gets charged to the area around the corridor. Um, it's kind of a hard area to describe because it was put in place in um, 2000 and it was put in place for the, all of the districts that were in place at the time. And then as the districts changed and we changed our boundaries, uh, we didn't change the sportsplex rate, whoever was in those original districts. So there is no boundary I can tell you. It's just if you go back and, and see. And then Mount Uniac has a recreation rate, so they're kind of saving for that next level of growth in their recreation function. They've just done a study, so they've been putting aside a partial part of the cent um, to build something, either a community hall or that kind of thing. So, so next is a little chat about the sportsplex. Um, I assume everyone's been in the sportsplex here. Or spent way too much time in it, like I have over the years. <laughs> Maybe my daughter's there right now. Um, so the Sportsplex was an independently uh, owned and operated facility up until 2021. Um, the East Hans Arena Association operated and still operates the facility. In 2021, the municipality took over ownership of the building and the land and has an operating agreement with the Sportsplex East Hans Arena Association to operate the facility. So they still do all the day-to-day. -day. Um, we have an area rate in place, and we had it in place before we took over ownership because we contributed financially to that building when it was built, and that area rate was paying down the debt on the $3 million we contributed originally. Uh, council did put up that area rate by one cent when they took over the building, and as we get used to managing that with the East Hans Arena Association will be managing that area rate to make sure that um, it stays sort of um, reasonable for folks. We do have money in reserves for the sportsplex. Um, we'll talk about reserves in a second. Um, and we just did a condition assessment of that building. So part of our uh, work for this coming year is to take that facility condition assessment and start doing some of the projects and work on the building. We also have reserves. So we have um, healthy reserves in East Hans, and what we use these for is pretty much everything. Um, reserves are used to fund some of those bigger expenditures that only happen every once in a while. So you don't have to keep upping your tax rate mm -hmm. down and up and down. You can put set aside a certain amount of money every year because you know you're gonna run an election every four years, for example, and it costs $120,000 to run an election. So every year you put aside enough money, so in year four you can pull that money out, pay for your election, and your tax rate doesn't have to go up by a cent, mm -hmm. and then come back down by a cent. We probably have, um, on any given year, we probably have 20 projects that we're bringing money in for reserves for that we had pre-planned for. Um, those could be anything from professional service studies that we have done. So this past year we did a capacity study for the water and wastewater system in the corridor, $200,000 study. We had the money sitting in reserves. So 
So we brought that money in, the Marines didn't have to go up and down to pay for that. So we have uh, healthy reserves, um, but they're all put aside for something. About four and a half million of them are set aside for gas tax projects, so that money's come from the federal government. Um, but about 4.2 million is contingency reserves. Those are your true monies that council can spend on something other than what it's been set aside for. Um, so that might be if you had an unexpected expense in, in education or RCMP or whatnot, you would pull money in from your contingency reserves. But when we need to buy a $300,000 loader for the Waste Management Center, we have reserves for that. We need to replace our laptops, we have reserves for that. So it's all managed. Um, it's a pretty big spreadsheet. Nothing for food. <laughs> Next year I'm putting money in my budget for these kinds of events and I'll get food. So this is sort of a, a graph of like the general operating money. So take, a, take out all the area rates and capital stuff and reserves and all that stuff. This is your operating budget um, stuff. So the, the things that people think about, parks and recreation and waste management and fire protection and whatnot. The, the purpose of showing you this graph is to point out that things that council has very little control of make up 43% of their budget. So we do have control over RCMP over how many officers we have, but beyond that we have no control. They set the per officer rate, we pay it. Um, the mandatory provincial transfers, we have no control over. Uh, basically the more assessment we get, the more we have to pay for education, for example. Fire protection, uh, those monies are all collected and sent out to the fire departments as fire levies. So yes, council has control over what they can collect, but very rarely do the fire departments ask for more than they need. So um, you know, if they ask for a 12 cent levy, then if that's what council will approve with their budget and whatnot. So it's quite significant that you have 43% of your budget of 41 million you have no control over. So talking with the fire levy, um, council spends a lot of, uh, invests a lot of time and, and money into the fire departments. We have 13 wonderful volunteer fire departments. Um, I believe we have one of the finest volunteer fire services in the province. I've been told that by many people that are um, very knowledgeable about fire services. Um, and we support them in several ways. We have our levies that we, we uh, collect for them. Our council also gives some of the smaller departments uh, operating grants. We have someone that we hire to do their risk management for them. So if they have insurance claims and whatnot, they're all volunteers. They don't have time to be dealing with all the administrative stuff. So as much of that kind of thing that we can do to help them, we do. <coughs> they keep their own, they operate their own departments, um, but we like to support them in any way we can. This year in particular, um, we're looking at a couple of things. Council has committed $225,000 to build a training facility in Knoll. So if you've driven by the Elmsdale Fire Department, you'll see there's containers in the back. That's actually a training facility. So to build something similar to that in Knoll, so they can have Tuesday night fire training, you know, bring people in on the weekends. Um, they actually put smoke through those and, and do their training, so they're, they're engineered. Uh, facilities and then we're also that would be for most of the departments and the right side of the municipality yeah we're also this year um, creating a promotional video for the volunteer fire service for um, volunteer recruitment so we hope to have a video created professional video that they can use in their recruitment efforts to make sure all the new folks in the community know that the fire service is volunteer and all the benefits they can get from belonging to that fire service um, education in our budget, I promised I wouldn't say a whole lot of numbers, but it's really important things. Um, education, as I mentioned, um, how many people in the room knew that you paid a third of your tax bill for property tax was education? Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Only because we stole it from the school board. <laughs> so yeah, one third of your tax bill we just collect and we send to the province as a check every quarter. And it's, it's been like that for years. Um, we pay a 30 cent, and for every $100 assessment on your home, you pay 30 cents towards education. 
$0.30.4. Cents. So when you see our, our dollars going, our assessments going up significantly, um, this is the difference between last year and the year before. Um, we've had a 9.7% increase in education this year, close to $600,000 we have to pay them. So just an education piece, because I don't think a lot of people even realize that, that that's what the provincial shared services is on your, your tax bill. Um, we also pay for um, housing, uh, community housing, and we pay for uh, roads, some of our old J-class roads. We pay for the province every year as well. So the coop strike might end up costing East Ants residents more on their property taxes. Well, they haven't changed the rate in a number of years. Okay. They just keep getting more money because our assessments keep going up. Okay. So what they'll do with the rate, uh, I'm not sure. Right now, the rate is frozen because they've been promising to deal with the issue for a long time, mm -hmm. and they haven't done that yet. Yeah. They're working on it. Um, RCMP is another big ticket item for us. Um, we have an RCMP office in Enfield. We have an RCMP office in Rawdon. And we have a satellite office in Mount Uniac, a, a small community office. Um, council does decide how many officers they, they pay for and what kind of model they want as a policing model in the community. We also pay on top of that um, a shared service cost, which is equivalent of, um, of one officer. And that shared service means that we have access to all the each division services uh, without question. So if we need divers, um, drug squad, um, if there's a homicide, we don't have to pay extra for those services. The only thing we pay extra for is um, DNA services. So if we did have a homicide in East Hans, the bill doesn't go up astronomically, but we do see a little bit of a bump in DNA costs. So council has decided, and they decided from um, a couple of years ago, to move to a new model of 28 officers with 24-hour policing. Right now we have on call, but this would be 24-hour um, service. So from 24 to 28 officers, significant increase in the investment in RCMP. Um, they're also doing a pilot project in East Hans where they've hired this, just they're hiring right now, a couple of um, additional department um, detachment assistants that will do a lot of the legislative work that officers have to do when they come off the shift, all the court documents and whatnot. Um, so the, the intention is, and this is a pilot, um, but the Justice Department is really looking at these hands quite closely to see if it works. The hope is that we can take some of that administrative burden off the officers, have them out in the street policing, and have other people going to court for them and doing all of those things that take up some of their time. So, um, we're excited. Um, two positions for two years is what council is committed to, and then we'll evaluate the impact that had on our on our police system. So it's pretty exciting stuff for, for policing going on. So as far as our business plan goes, um, these are all tied to our strategic plan. So I'm going to go into a little bit now um, on what kind of projects we have on the go. And if there's any questions about any of these, we can certainly answer them. Um, as far as sustainable infrastructure, so our goal is to provide the infrastructure that your community needs to grow and to be, to be sustainable. Um, even if we weren't growing, we would still have investment in infrastructure. It just looks very different when you're in growth mode. So Shubenacadie has been sort of closed for business uh, for a number of years because we reached capacity in the wastewater treatment in Shubenacadie a number of years ago. We are now on the cusp of opening a new wastewater treatment plant, so about nine and a half million dollar plant, um, which will really open the potential for Shubenacadie again and make it somewhere where people can start to build and, and whatnot. We've actually had to just not issue permits in Shubenacadie for a number of years. So with the new, it had a new water treatment plant uh, probably six or seven or eight years ago. Um, it's got a new wastewater treatment plant. Shubenacadie will be open for business. And hopefully that will be finished by uh, March of, of this coming year. Um, and that plant, we did get $3.5 million of provincial and federal funding, so that helped quite significantly. Um, water treatment plant in Shubenacadie has been built. The one in Enfield, when we built it in 2008, we built it with extra capacity to expand, knowing that we were going to have the growth that we're seeing now. 
So we're actually going out to tender fairly soon, if we haven't already, on building another tank into the Enfield water treatment plant. So that will add the capacity that we need for the development um, that you're seeing. Um, we do have an asset management program underway. Uh, you've probably seen we've been trying to hire an asset coordinator in the paper, and we keep trying. So um, we just actually promoted um, from inside, and I stole one of John's staff and moved her over. So uh, then you'll see we're looking for a GIS technician, <laughs> which we hopefully have found. Um, so the asset management program, you'll hear a lot about this if you follow municipal, uh, you know, what we're doing. Um, we need, we of course take care of our assets and we, you know, maintain them and whatnot, but it's very reactive. Um, and with the, the amount of assets we have, buildings like this, the sportsplex that we've taken over, the Lloyd Matheson Center next door, um, and all of our sewer and water um, pipes in the ground and whatnot, we really do need to get a, a handle on managing those in a, in a coordinated fashion. So we've been managing them. This is just sort of pulling them all together so we know all of our preventative maintenance schedules and warranties and all of that will be in one place. It's a massive project. Um, it'll be very GIS based, but for eventually for residents like you folks, um, you'll be able to sort of pinpoint assets around your community and, and it'll be phenomenal, but um, a lot of work to get there. Uh, we also have, you know, we talk about water capacity, you need to talk about your water loss. So when you have older systems, older pipes in the ground, you need to be very cognizant of your water loss that you're treating and it's just going nowhere. Um, so we do have a district metering project, so we can sort of try and isolate some of the losses we have. Every water utility has them, we're not alone. Um, but, but instead of building more capacity in a treatment plant, you can sort of capture what you're losing and, and get capacity that way. So that's one of the projects we have on the go. And then we have lots of water and wastewater um, collection system upgrades. So especially around our wastewater in Lance, there's a lot of uh, pipes that you'll see replaced over the next few years. And really as, as the new developments come on board, it's driving some of that need because the more you have in your system, the more overload there is than sort of those pressure points start to show their, their head and you're gonna deal with them. We dealt with that a lot in Chumanakity when we put in the new water tower. Um, the pressure on the system, it hadn't seen pressure like that from a new tower. So all of a sudden all the pipes started to burst and break. Um, and it wasn't fun for anybody, trust me. Um, it was expected, but Pam I think was probably counselor at the time. And it was, uh, I got some lot. recollection. Yeah. <laughs> That's why she's not a counselor anymore. Um, so um, continue now with sustainable infrastructure. We talked about the facility condition assessment for the sportsplex. We'll be doing facility condition assessments for most of our major facilities that are older. And again, that's to feed that asset management system. Um, we've done some facility condition or f assessments on things like our sidewalks and our roads and, and those things. And we've got to feed all the information to the system so we can then better do better capital planning and maintenance planning. Um, anyone in here live in White Estates? Okay. You'll see some traffic calming. Going on in the United States, if you live there. Um, Council has approved a two or three year project to get some traffic common initiatives in our subdivisions. White Estates is the first plan of that. So, sort of some speed tables, um, more stop signs. Um, um, you'll see some of the, the radar signs going in around the community where you come in and out of East Hans, or sort of into East Hans from Halifax and Colchester County. Uh, you'll start to see some of those speed signs just to give people some awareness that you know people live here these are communities um, i heard someone lived on the uh bought a house on the number two so reminding those people that you know our children play in the front yards that type of thing um so we've also got a, a road gap paving project um, you'll see the little map over there is the lance subdivisions so when you drive through those land subdivisions and, the, and some of the Enfield subdivisions are part of the program, there are little tiny pieces of roads that aren't paved. Yeah. And if you're new to the community, you're probably like, what the heck? <laughs> and 
what happened back in the day is we built all of our municipal roads that were gravel. And then over time, people who wanted to pave their roads paid to pave their road. So they all got together, did a petition, they paid a couple thousand dollars each, and they got their roads paved. Well, on those little tiny stretches where there was no one who actually had a driveway on them or it was just two people, they were like, we're not paying to pave our road. And over time, <laughs> over time we have these little gaps that no one is going to pave and no one's going to pay to pay. So council finally, um, we had some dates that we had to, to meet. Um, we put all those paving projects together in one um, and we're going to get them done, get them paved. We're going to charge people different amounts depending on how close they are to the road and whatnot. Um, wasn't an easy model to come up with because everybody has an opinion on whether it's fair or not or whether they should pay or not. Um, but to build our community and to grow it, we need to have it done. So um, that will actually be happening this fall. Uh, we got the provincial funding to do to do that project. Is so, it block while you're at it? Not on these little roads, no. no. Um, they're, they're new subdivisions. When developers are building them, they do have to put sidewalks in them. But these little paving pieces won't be. Um, we've also got some physical security audits in our budget for our own buildings. Uh, we've had a couple of scares with um, not so nice customers um, for, against the municipality. It's just the reality of what we do now. Um, so if you go into our building now, you'll start to see a little more plexiglass and a little more security and. Um, so we just said we're going to do security audits of, of all of our buildings to make sure our staff are safe when they're working in them. And then we also have a disposal of surplus property project, which we've been trying to get off the ground for a number of years, but we seem to sort of, every time I have a staff to do it, something happens and, you know, pandemics or things like that happen. Um, maternity leaves have kind of kicked them a couple times. So essentially we have a lot of little pieces of property around the municipality that we own that don't have any value to you as a taxpayer. Um, they just add liability to the municipality. So the idea is that um, we will take a look at all those properties. Council has a policy on how they dispose of properties. So maybe if it's a little sliver, it's offered to the neighbor. If it's a valuable piece of land, we might put it out for tender, put it on the open market, you know, whatever it might be. But there's a very public process around all of that. So it's not a, a small project, but it's one that we have to do. I think we have it as a two-year project, and I'm hoping that we can get it started um, this spring of 2024, or winter 2023-24. Um, the other thing that all of you are probably fairly aware of is that we have two rather large pieces of property in the middle of Elmsdale and in the middle of Lance. So the, Elm, the old Elmsdale School property and the old land school property um, are two pieces the council is looking at now as to what those should be for the community um, and how they how we should interact with them as properties in our community so council has had um, a couple of sessions with um, Dillon consulting and they're sort of taking us through the highest and best use of those two properties and what they uh, might look like um, and I think most of you probably know the old Elmsdale School. It's right across from, um, just sort of kitty corner down from McDonald's. The Lance property is the one that, if you go down to the old rink, there's an old rink in the post office, that area. It's the piece right on the corner. Um, you can sort of, if you stood on it and looked down, you can see the old rink uh, from there. So pretty exciting, um, looking at things like public open spaces, what kind of buildings should be built there for the community, do we need, you know, ponds, parks, fountains, buildings, business, housing, whatever it might be. Um, council is, has, uh, has some pretty interesting decisions to make around these two properties in the next couple of years. Did it get the community involved in that, or how is it involved in this? We haven't yet. Um, council sort of needs to get their head around it first as to what they're doing. Um, I'm not sure what the public engagement process will look like. For Lance, there definitely has to be one. Um, we have a motion of council from years ago saying that there has to be a, a public process to for whatever we do with that property. Um, one of the commitments council has made for Lance 
is that the fire department will, will be able to go there um, and build a new fire department. Okay. So that will, that's sort of the, the cornerstone. And then what else can fit on the property that might work? Since I'm on the main road, yeah. So this is another pretty exciting project if you live in Helmsdale, uh, Enfield area. Um, we have what we call our active transportation project. It's $1.7 million worth of sidewalk upgrades um, in Helmsdale, Enfield, or sort of Lance Helmsdale. Um, actually, it's all Helmsdale, but it's coming from Lance. So we got about $1.2 million of funding. So this is all happening this year, because our funding expires in March 2024. Um, so what you'll see is, this is the corner coming up towards the um, Lino stores right here. So between this parking lot and the corner, um, there was never a sidewalk, a real sidewalk built there. So that will be a concrete sidewalk built up to the corner. Um, section 2 that you see along the 214, along Brook Court up towards the 102. Um, that's going to be widening of that existing asphalt sidewalk. Um, section 3, which is this part here, um, this will be a little bit of sidewalk. The, the struggle we've had is the cluster that is that overpass in Elmsdale. So, we're limited by what we can do because eventually Highways wants to replace that overpass and mm -hmm. put in something and manage traffic through there. Um, so we're, we're putting in little sections that we know will be sustainable. Um, what we really want to do, we can't do. So, you know, we wanted to build a bridge over the 102, so mm -hmm. we just ignore all of it. Because <laughs> you drive by it, right? You see this, and you're like, oh, that's cool. We should build one of those. Yeah. Well, those people don't have a great big median in the way. Uh, that they have to get over and what we thought might be a million dollars was actually like 3.7 for a bridge, sidewalk, <laughs> kind of silly. So um, we're doing some work there. What we're going to do is, I don't know about you folks, but my kids, I would never let walk over that um, where the cars come and they zoom onto the highway right over here. Um, so we're going to kind of square that up a little bit so we slow traffic down to get onto the highway, not to a crawl. You won't notice it, but people who need to cross the road will. Um, and then once you get past the on-ramp, you'll be able to come into this facility through a trail into the back parking lot down here to the, to the pool. And then we'll have a sidewalk carry on to the corner by the Superstore, which is right here. Um, and then from the Superstore, you cross the road in the lights from the Superstore up to just past Carmi's. There'll be an active transportation trail up to a new development that's happening up there. So, good news for sort of helping build that, that active transportation for folks. If you live in the new apartment buildings down by Carmi's, easy walk, safe walk up to the Superstore. And really, that, that sidewalk work um, flows into the master plan we have for the corridor. So I don't know if you can see the, the lighting in here is not great, but we'll talk about these developments in a little bit. You've got Lance Developments. This is the subdivision in Lance, Poplar Drive subdivision. So the intention, Lino, would be to build sidewalks through some of that subdivision. Um, so all the development that's happening will have active transportation sidewalks. So you'll be able to go from the north end of Lance, for, re for reference, this is Robert Scott Drive. So all through Lance, all through the new subdivisions, across the Nine Mile River Bridge, or the Nine Mile River here on a bridge, in behind Sobeys and out to that new piece of sidewalk that I just talked about that we were building. Then from there, you come down the number 214 here, and you'll go into the new development that FHF FH Developments um, is trying to do behind here, and then all the way through the Enfield, through some of the other work that we've been doing. So that's the vision. It's a long-term vision, and it starts with working with developers and working with private homeowner landowners to sort of make all of that happen. So you get little pieces built, and then 
we just have a few little pieces that kind of put it all together. So that's the long-term vision for active transportation in the corridor. Active transportation um, is important across the municipality. We have several interesting trails in Mount Uniac that we hope to someday be able to develop. Um, this property uh, in the rural area of East Hans, from um, Stanley through to, I can never say this word, Eleanor, Mantua? Mattaway. Mattaway. <laughs> Not even close. Um, we have just purchased what they refer to as the DAR line. So it's an old Dominion Railway line that goes straight across the municipality. It's a beautiful flat trail. Unfortunately, it's been in disrepair a little bit, so you've got bridges that are out and whatnot. So the long-term planning is starting for that acquisition now. Not quite sure what it's going to look like. We're not calling it a trail um, because council has to figure out what it's going to be. You'll see if you live around that area, you'll see some signs going up saying that we're not maintaining it. Um, you know, don't cross on the broken bridges, that type of thing. But for years, it, sections of it have been used for um, active transportation. A lot of those crossings, the bridges were taken out when the railway stopped, yeah. and there aren't even broken bridges. There's yeah. nothing. So we're working, we're looking to work with different community groups and different um, associations that have interest in using the non-trail trail. Not allowed to call it a trail. <laughs> We're already finding that the signs have gone up and they're disappearing. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake. Yeah, that's how it's going. Anyway, we do own the, the it wasn't a small feat. Um, it took many years to actually get all the players together to, to buy the land. Um, Pam was on council how many years ago? And yeah, I'm remembering how far back. I think early 2000s we probably started. This. I remember we when Eleanor it. was council at Ralston and she and I went out and yeah. visited some landowners out there. Yeah. So exciting that we've got it done. Good for the <laughs> <laughs> um, So here's for a little bit about our corporate excellence stuff that we have on the go. So again, this is really about how we as a municipality do business. So um, the way that the municipal structure is, we have a council of 11. I'm their CAO. I'm actually their only employee. And then I have the employees of the municipality as my employees. So this is really the work that we're doing to run the municipality so that you folks feel connected and, and, and welcome to it. Um, we are working on accessibility. You'll see a new website coming out in the next few months. Um, accessible websites are not nearly as pretty as non-accessible websites, so brace yourselves. But uh, those with accessible needs will be able to use our website and interact with it in a way that they've never been able to do before. So it's wonderful for us. Um, you'll see lots of accessible initiatives to make our buildings and facilities and services more accessible. And it starts with changing all of our templates, for example. So screen readers can read our templates. You have to have your lines all in the right place and your headings all have to be properly labeled. And it's a massive amount of work when you have as much documentation as we have. Um, but we've committed to it. Um, and by 2030, the province wants most municipal and or government entities um, to be accessible and um, we've committed to get there. Um, lots of work going on at the Waste Management Center. Probably the biggest thing is our new solid waste contracts have been launched. Um, every five or ten years we get new service providers. So we've got new service providers. We're doing a phenomenal job. Of course, we had a few Facebook bumps along the way. That, um, by the way, we do not accept plastic compost. <laughs> Just in case you didn't get the message. Um, even though they sell them, we'd ask them not to, but we don't accept them. Um, and that's because the company that processes our compost doesn't don't accept, accept them. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. We're not trying to be difficult. We love everyone <laughs> like garbage floor. Um, so we're doing work like every other uh, entity should be on service excellence and cybersecurity and all of those things. Um, lots of signage work that we need to have done. So we have consistent branding in our signage across all of our different um, municipal facilities and services. 
There's Mayor Brad. <laughs> Come on in. This is Brad, your friendly neighborhood chiropractor. <laughs> And I'm like, pass his life alone back Brad owns Renew Health across the road. If anyone hasn't been there, I highly recommend you go. Yes, amazing. Should we applaud Brad? Thank you. <laughs> um, and then we're doing a lot of work in our organization as well with diversity, equity, and inclusion training and getting folks comfortable with the idea of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but again, we have some pretty lofty goals for the next three or four years on just bringing the awareness, not only to our staff and to our council, but actually to our community. So we have an initiative here in Corporate Excellence to make sure that we are aware, um, but we also have under our strong community to make sure that our community is aware and that our community um, takes that lens when we're dealing with each other. So one of the things um, on the strong community piece which might seem small, but we actually installed two new flagpoles um, at the municipal office last year. So on the slide, I went ahead. So last year we installed two new flagpoles. So now we have um, we fly the Mi'kmaq flag consistently, and we also have one extra flagpole that we can use to fly flags for um, special months, special days, to represent uh, the diversity of our community. So it's. Um, I didn't really think it would have that much of an impact until I talked to people who say, oh, my daughter and I were driving by the municipal office the other day and we saw the pride flag flying and you know, she went into her class and talked about it and then her teacher engaged with them and talked about it. And so it really is making a difference um, in the community and that's not just one story. I've had people say to me, we saw an interesting flag, we went home and looked it up and we didn't realize it was African Heritage Month or it was whatever. Um, so it really is, people are coming out of the aquatic center, seeing the flags, having conversations with their family, so it's made a big difference. Um, the next strategic priority for us is strong community. Um, so making sure that we have services and programs and facilities, and not just us, but that we support community groups that have these as well, um, that allow people and businesses to thrive. So. That is really what you folks would see day to day as you see the municipality provide services to your community. One of the biggest, by far, um, initiatives under Strong Community is sort of the long-term planning that we have to do. So John and his staff have been working for the past two years on a plan update. So we have three documents that form our community plan. Um, for the last two years, we've been updating sort of the, the um, based the master plan. And then the provincial government, um, in their wisdom, said that all of Nova Scotia had to be planned and zoned and whatnot, which was never the case before. So most of our rural East Hands was never, didn't have planning. The only zoning it had was wind energy zoning. So over the last two years, uh, council has tackled several issues. They're listed here. Um, a lot of those relate to sort of that rural zoning um, and issues and how do the folks in the rural area want to be zoned? Do they want to be? Do they not want to be? And of course there's mixed... Most of them don't. Most of them don't, unless it's an issue that impacts them and then they do. Um, so it's been a real challenge and kudos to John and his staff and to council for working through that. Uh, we do have a final document that went through Planning Advisory Committee yesterday, so that will be going to public hearing next. Um, public hearing, John, or public information yeah, meeting? Public hearing in July. Again. Public hearing in July. So if you live in the rural area, make sure you pay attention. You'll, you'll be getting a letter if your zoning is changing. Um, but we encourage public participation in that process. And you can come and tell council what you think about what they've done and uh, how it might impact you. Um, and we hope we get lots of, uh, lots of feedback. But it's been a fairly open public process to date, so there's been lots of public meetings and um, that hundreds of people showed up to, so it's been really good as far as public engagement goes. They weren't all happy with us. Um, other things around strong community that we're working on this year coming up, and there are a lot. Um, the land secondary planning strategy is on 
the list. So for all of those of you who can picture it, when you go down to the new uh, interchange in Lance, you've got Lance on one side of the highway, and on the other side of the highway there's lots of empty land. Mm -hmm. So when you drive off the interchange, there's a bunch of bollards that are on one side. Well, we need to figure out where that road's going to go and what's going to be on this. That's the simplest way I can put it. There's a lot more to it than that, but essentially, before everybody starts buying land and coming in and asking for, because there's no water and sewer over there, you know, how do we service it? What's the best servicing model? Who wants to buy land? Is it business? Is it residential? Is it high rises? Is it low rises? All of those things. Where does it connect through? So if you look at, um, this is my subdivision here. Anyone who lives out in Bell Nan, so Andrea and Brad are out here. When you come out through here, eventually you can go from that exchange and do we want it to connect into the Garden Road here? Do we want it to connect out to the 214 again? Like how are we gonna bring that centrality to that area and the connectivity? So John is gonna figure that out in the next 12 months. <laughs> And again, <laughs> that's a lot of plots of land to coordinate. That's when I try to look at that, I'm like, that's a lot of different landowners. Yeah. <laughs> so it'll be a very public process, but again, if you don't do that, then you have this mishmash of stuff. And, yeah. you know, first, first things first is a servicing plan for that side of the highway because it doesn't have services. Those are pretty important for, for um, dense development anyway. Um, Mount Uniac secondary planning strategy, again, Mount Uniac is in a major growth mode. They've got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of um, subdivision plans and whatnot, so we really do need to look at sort of how to make that um, more sustainable development patterns, cluster developments, that type of thing. We actually had uh, master students from Dalhousie do a presentation to council last month. Phenomenal job on sort of some recommendations around septic systems and cluster systems and whatnot for denser development in Mount Uniac, so that'll form part of that. Um, so, so for those of you in Shubenacadie, I did mention you've been sort of lacking development over the last few years. The other part when you look at Shuby and you look at the village core is it's very difficult for businesses there to meet parking requirements in the village core um, and to sort of upgrade their businesses and upgrade some of those downtown buildings. So the municipality is looking at the large area of parking in Shubenacadie, upgrading that and making it sort of that central service parking so that anyone can park there and then the businesses don't have to meet their parking requirements because we've got more parking. And hopefully that's going to sort of reinvigorate some of that downtown Shubenacadie village core area if they don't have to meet those parking requirements that they currently do. Um, we do have a housing strategy on the books for this year. Um, tr tricky subject because housing is not a municipal um, responsibility. But of course we have a significant investment in housing in East Hans. So the province is working on a housing strategy and a housing plan for the province. We need to look at how our planning documents and how council's policies can support bringing um, appropriate housing to East Hands. So again, John will be, John's going to be a busy guy this year. Um, he'll be looking at the housing strategy for this year and what we should be doing to enable that uh, improved housing in East Hands. Uh, RCMP policing model I mentioned earlier, so we're, we're working on that. The volunteer fire recruitment I mentioned. Um, we do have, if you have not been to Burnt Coat Head Park, I highly recommend you go. It is such a fun afternoon. Take your kids if you have them, take your bare feet for sure, and go when the tide is low. That would be my advice to you. Um, it's also pretty when it's high, but it's not nearly as much fun. If you um, like mud. <laughs> if you like mud. It doesn't like mud. Um, Council's also, where you've seen probably if you have children, you've seen our play boxes that are going, uh, we have a couple more going out this year into the playgrounds. Those have been a great success. We did the pilot last year. There's one outside. There's one outside in this playground. Oh, yes, okay. Um, I should play with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if they get used a ton. Um, I can look out my office window to the, to the splash pad 
and see all your stuff playing. All, <laughs> <laughs> all season long, like the shoulder seasons, kids are out there playing. You got families having picnics in the park, and the kids playing the play box. Like it's quite fun to watch it. Uh, Is your information as to where they are? Okay. Um, yeah, they're. If you go on our website, there's actually a. Um, an interactive tool on our website that'll tell you where all of our parks are, playgrounds, play boxes, um, trails, anything interact like anything to get outdoors. There's an outdoor East Tina, I forget what it's called, but it's um, you sort of scroll in, scroll out, and see where everything is. Um, I can actually tell. There's one in the Bell Nam playground. There's one here, and there's one in the Logan Park playground. I believe. I think those are the three we put out last year. And then there's a couple more going in this year. So we'll put them on our Facebook page when they go in so people know. And then for those folks that aren't on, um, that aren't on services, council is, is, has approved um, a septic loan, replacement pro septic replacement loan program. So if you need to replace your septic and you can't afford to go out and get the loan that you need or whatnot, Council will lend you up to $20,000 for septic and well uh, together. Um, and then there's also a solar program that we're running through Efficiency uh, no. Efficiency Nova Scotia? No. Yeah, anyway, someone else administers it for us. Um, the council puts up the money to loan people if they want to do solar upgrades. That was fully sold out last year. Um, and the septic and well program is going to take some time to sort of get all the, the bylaws in place and whatnot, because the lien will go against your house, and then as you pay it off, um, you know, it, it gets paid down. But if you sell your house, then the lien goes with, with your house. Is that program still open? We haven't opened it yet. Um, we haven't got all the, they just approved it. To, to start working on it. So over the summer, we'll be working on all the bylaws and policies we have to have in place for it to work. And then the provincial government will have to approve those bylaws, and then we'll be able to start giving loans out. And so when uh, do you anticipate that happening? Um, I would guess by late fall, we should have. And so what if you've taken out a loan to, to do your solar work? Uh, can you oh, solar? Solar is already happening. Um, if you've already taken out the loan, I don't think it would qualify, but you can call the office and find out. We are, that, the solar program is already in place. I thought you were talking about the well and septic. The well and septic will be later this year. And so who do you speak to? Just call the main office and ask to talk to someone about the solar program, and they'll put you through. There's somebody here with us. Oh, yeah. um, so for the well and septic loans, you said that it would be a lien and that if you sell the property, it would go with the house. Yeah. So is that something that will be disclosed to the new homeowners? It would be, yeah. yeah. That it would show up? It would show up like if, that. if they got a tax certificate. Is there an option to like pay out? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can pay it out before you sell your house. So the other thing that we've been doing um, a lot of in the last few years is building playgrounds. If you've noticed, there have been a lot of playgrounds built around East Hands as part of our Stronger Community Initiative. Um, we have built um, quite a nice playground uh, working with uh, Calgreg in the Belnan subdivision. Um, last year we did sport courts there and we did a green space expansion. We've got a Concord Way Park. Um, and we did some extra swing installations there last year. Um, we've also been putting through a lot of the, um, the picnic shelters that you see in our playgrounds, which we never had before. Mm -hmm. So that's adding a whole other element of using those spaces for the community. Um, and we see a lot, of, uh, a lot of use for those. Um, let me just see here, I don't miss any. Um, also, last year in 2020, um, if you drive down the 215, you'll, um, if you ever stop at Dawson Dell, we were actually, for our tourism experience along the 215, we didn't have anywhere where people can stop and use a washroom mm -hmm. um, that was available. So, um, primary functions of tourism were T and P. Mm -hmm. Lots of places have T, nowhere to pee. <laughs> so, we did some work at Dawson Dell Park a couple of years ago. 
Um, and we've built some pretty phenomenal playgrounds around. Um, Mount Uniac has a beautiful playground uh, that we put in a few years ago, and, and just lots of really great work. Um, last year in Shubenacadie, the um, association that managed the park area asked us to step in and take ownership of the property um, and to take uh, upgrade that facility. So we've done that. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend a visit to Shubenacadie. Uh, there's some great ice cream stores in Shuby, beautiful park, nice playground. Um, and really that's getting a huge amount of use, um, especially this time of year with the fishing, uh, fishing along the river. So you can go fishing along the river, you've got your playground, there's lots of walking trails. Um, I think we're, you know, we're seeing up to 100 plus fishers a day there in the spring. Uh, we've just added an extra porta potty, so if you hear anyone complain about not enough porta potties there, <laughs> we just put a new one in this week. Um, but lots of really great work, um, and that was we did get some funding from uh, the provincial and federal government for that project as well. And a lot of I should mention too, a lot of our playgrounds are they're not fully accessible playgrounds. But what we're trying to do is make sure that there's an accessible component, at least in the playgrounds. Um, so a lot of the playgrounds that we've been doing, we've um, applied to the provincial government for additional funding to put like uh, accessible spinners, accessible swings, um, all of our paths and whatnot are accessible. So as much as we can, we're, we're adding elements that are accessible. Um, a few examples here of the playgrounds we have coming up this year. Um, so we have one at Dawson Dow, um, one at Walton Fire in Walton. So those two, we hope, um, will draw younger folks to live in those communities. It's a lot easier to move to a community with kids if you see that the infrastructure is there to support them. Um, we also have a playground for Megan Lynn Drive in the budget. And we have the, if you, if you think about the Clayton development section, we're not building any of that yet, but when they get into their center build, um, they'll have a fairly extensive park, hopefully next year, um, where you see there's some tennis courts and sport courts and um, fountains and whatnot. I'm um, sorry, whereabouts where is that? That's in Lance, and one of the new um, one of the new developments in Lance that have all the brick houses that go up that one road. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, once you get further in there, there's sort of a center to that uh, building. Oh, okay. Um, so there'll be a big community park in the center. Future um, Council. Hmm? Future Council. Future Council. <laughs> uh, we also have a new playground. We may not get this one built this year, but we are going to try. Um, sort of a project that got sprung on us by a late night truck driving into the um, center of Rodden Hall. <laughs> So instead of rebuilding their hall, they've decided to put a new playground in the facility, in the area. Um, so we're working with that community group to, we're taking the insurance funds and, and building community space for them. So that's for the last one that um, I want to talk about for the strategic plan is the economic prosperity. So basically that's making sure we have the commercial districts we need to support the community and the businesses that want to come here. You can't have 5,000 new people move to an area and not have room for businesses to come in and support them. Um, with businesses, you need people. So part of what we've been working on is, um, as I said, the, the workforce development plan and making sure that we have what we need. So council just heard yesterday actually the economic development strategy. So if you wanted to look at that, that would be on our all of our council meetings and committee meetings are live streamed. Um, so if you ever hear about a topic that was talked about in council or committee, you can always go to our webpage and um, listen to the live stream. Are the council meetings kept up for longer than three months yet? Yeah. Cool. Yep. So this council really is focusing on the 2050 vision. 2060, 2070, seems like a long way away. But when you think about the councils in the 1990s did large infrastructure studies, put in infrastructure charges for the community, did all of those things in the 1990s because Clayton had just bought a big stretch of land, because Armco had just bought a big stretch of land. And they said, 
oh, wonder what they're going to do with those. <laughs> we should plan for that and make sure that the residents of East Hans don't have to pay for all that development. So they did that back in the 90s. Now it's our turn. So we need to do that for 2050, 2060. So we're doing those infrastructure studies. We're doing a lot of the planning studies that I've mentioned. There are more in the plan. The ones I mentioned are just ones we plan to do this year. So there's lots of studies that need to be done to guide our decisions and make sure the council has the right um, data to make those decisions. Uh, we have a lot of sort of peripheral efforts uh, underway to support business that are in East Hans. Um, but primarily for uh, the manager of business development, we're looking at how do we expand our business parks. You saw earlier of the $7 million or $10 million in the assessment we had, seven and a half million of it came from this business park. So it makes sense that we expand those business parks, expand for jobs and for assessment. Um, and again, municipal housing strategy, not only a, a housing problem, it's a business problem as well because they need people here to work and they need people to live here and spend money in the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the last bullet point is review transit as a service. Um, council has looked at transit a couple of times in the past. It hasn't been sort of economically feasible at that point. This spring we'll be taking back another report to them. Right now there's lots of money available for green transit in rural communities, which were considered a rural community. Um, so the message from council last time was, not yet, let's wait till there's money available. And there's, you know, I just, I spent a, an hour today talking to somebody about a grant program that's $500 million for this and $300 million for that. And so how do we tap into that and we need to be ready? So council's gonna to have that conversation. Um, we talked a little bit about workforce development, so I won't dwell too much on this. Um, just to point out that we have about, of our 25,000 residents, we have about 12,000 in the workforce. And over, about 60% of those folks leave East Hands every day to go work in Halifax. Crazy. Crazy. So, how do we get those so folks... they can pay the taxes here. They live here. They live here and they leave to go. Yeah. We're going to do a kick to another work? Yes, we okay. need to create business so they can stay here. Um, we have about 2,700 people who actually live in East Hans and work in East Hans, which is like I live and work in East Hans. I'm one of the fortunate ones. Um, and then we have a few hundred that go to Truro, Colchester Way. Um, but primarily, we're sending 60% of our people into uh, Halifax. So that within the, you know, within these, <coughs> like I work from home, yeah. would that, would I fall in that then, or, is, and is, has that adjusted because of the pandemic at all? So this is 2016 numbers from the last okay. census, so wherever you report your census that you work to, so now I think that will change a lot, because I think you will have a lot of people that are reporting that they work in East Hans. Yeah. Yes. Is the airport considered Halifax? Halifax, yeah. Um, so we don't a lot of that is Halifax. Halifax. Yeah. I'm sure Graham knows that number, but I don't know. And so do we know when that report's going to be done again? The next time. 2021. Okay. Yeah. We'll we just, do we have, we probably haven't dove, dove deep into the 2021 yet. We've done the basic numbers, um, but we should have it. It happens every four years, yeah. every five years. Um, so we talked a little bit about transit. Um, this is just a map from the old report that we had done. Um, so we have we have consider done considerable amount of work twice on transit planning in these stands. So we have potential routes. We have where we need bus stops. We have a lot of that work. We have timings and and what kind of buses, how many buses. Um, the last time we did the report, we looked. Um, you know, how can the corridor transportation folks help us in our, tra in our transit service? So that was another model that we looked at. But again, we'll be going back to council this fall. There's also um, a joint regional transportation agency that's been created by the province. And again, back to their growing the economy um, and growing the population, they know that that population is going to grow within an hour of Halifax. That's just a, a given. So what they've done is created an agency and staffed it up with folks who are going to be looking at um, 
how we move people and, and goods from Halifax to within an hour of Halifax. So that's their mandate. And they have a mandate to produce that report by fall of 2024, which is massive. So they're working with the Port Authority, Halifax Transit. Um, oh, who else is in there, John? Um, well, they're working with municipalities, but we're not, we're not actually like in their committee. Um, it's the Bridge Commission. The Bridge Commission. The port, the airport, HIM. And ECOA. Yeah, ECOA. So, it's, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that they can, can make some stuff work. You know, a lot of people are talking about is it, oh, we need fast transit and trains and whatnot. That's the kind of stuff that they'll be looking at to say, how do you get your 17 year old from the middle of the land subdivision into downtown Halifax effectively so that they can actually use that transportation, whatever it looks like. So, exciting times. And hopefully, we can tie into that with our transit. What's that? Get up to the Yeah, because we don't have any money to build it. We no. don't. Have, no, it's they're talking like hundreds of millions of dollars. Like that's not municipal kind of dollars. That's that's a big agency. Um, another neat project we have is the Elmsdale Village Core concept. So that was proposed in April of 2022. So basically, it's how do we take the Elmsdale Village Core from about that Elmsdale School area down towards the lights, and how do we plan for that to be more than just a through fare for cars? Mm -hmm make it you know more of a, a village core um, so there is a report online if you want to go on and read all the details um, but essentially making it sort of that sense of community not going to happen tomorrow not going to happen tomorrow <laughs> but but you can't do these things and and make expect them to happen 20 years from now and just look like that right you have to have a policy that in place to make sure that people aren't building things that are going to be in the way of your vision so you're not tearing down buildings in 15 years because you wanted to look put a street tree there, right? It's you got to plan long term for these things. Um, as I mentioned, we have the Down Uniac Business Park. We did one phase of expansion. There's another phase of expansion planned uh, for this year, and we did the Elmsdale Business Park. The latest expansion was the Loop up at the top. If you haven't driven up there, um, take a drive. There's lots of uh, buildings going up and lots of biz lots of business. Um, there's also a couple of places that are for rent, so they have they built for the purpose of leasing. So um, it's down this way. Yeah. 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 There's a there's a place you can buy for under the condominium act too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no unit there. Yeah. So some good development. I don't think left in the back. So things are all sold. There's one lot left that has someone's uh, I won't say name on it, but you know. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about development, um, I'm going to just take you through these three developments fairly quickly. Um, this is in FH Development in Enfield, or sorry, in Elmsdale. So if you imagine going across the highway and you're, um, you're at the Elmsdale School, the old Elmsdale School, if you look behind that school, there's a big track of land that goes and connects up to Elmwood subdivision and connects down to the number two um, almost. So that is this FH development um, that's being proposed. Uh, Clayton development is on the other side of the river where those new houses are being built um, in lands with the brick, they're all brick. Uh, there's a couple of big signs up there on the number two. And then a little further down, um, past the subdivisions, you've got Armco Capital, which is um, another big development. So we're going to start with Armco Capital. So down by Robert Scott Drive, this is all the, the current subdivisions and lands. So this is sort of the build-out plan for Armco Capital. Um, 2,200 2, dwelling units proposed for this area. So the yellow sections are sort of your low density, your single family homes. Your blue is where you get to your medium density. So you're looking at single um, uh, townhouses and duplexes. In the pink is where you see sort of your um, high density, your apartment buildings and whatnot. And then the dark orange in this example um, would be your mixed use. So you have sort of commercial residential buildings, we have commercial on the bottom maybe, and some apartments up top, that type of thing. 
And then all around here, you've got the green dotted lines are all active transportation trails. There's actually green space all along Barney's Brook that will be cleared with trails. And this is the trail that sort of connects into that master spine that I showed you earlier. So that's a big development at the end of Lance. The next one is Kiln Creek. Um, I should say too, Wickwire Station, we actually have a park called Wickwire Station in Milford. So don't get too confused under UPS. Um, we named ours first. So this will happen with the station? That uh, Armco one I just showed you, they're calling it Wickwire Station. Oh! Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And we also have a park yeah. called Wickwire Station. So okay. someone has to blink, <laughs> and I'm not sure who it's going to be. <laughs> Um, so Kiln Creek is the Clayton development, the one that you've started to see. Um, so it's the, the big apartment building in Lance that's been built on the highway, and then those houses. That's all sort of along this number two area. Um, and then you'll, so this is the school and that's the rink, just for context. So again, here you've got the yellow, uh, there's about 198 single family dwellings in the yellow. Um, there's single, uh, detached, and townhouses. There's about 240 units. Your MOVE area in this case are where your sort of your apartment buildings and your townhomes will go. Right up along the highway? Uh, yep, yeah, there's some here. Oh, okay. And then there's some here and some over there. So what's going right in front of Maplewood? Like, is that apartment building? Is that, is that right? You know, it's no, multi. No. Yes, th those will be multi there. This is or no, sorry, uh, that, here. That's commercial. Yeah. That's, that's um, commercial. Then are you talking about this block here? No, but the one yeah, here. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, I think the development agreement allows them to do either mixed use, commercial, or multi. Okay. Um, and then the um, the light blue or the garden homes that you see, the they've already built quite a few of their garden homes in that. Mm -hmm. loop by the apartment building. So I think the biggest thing for community here impact is going to be all the land up by the interchange up here. That's all your commercial land. So you're going to start to see, and we don't know, we're not to keep it a secret because we don't know what they're going to build up there. Um, they of course have a whole team of people that are working with the name brands. Yeah. I'm not going to say any because I'm <laughs> um, To build out that commercial development at the highway. And that will be their prerogative what they what they put there um, and then to me the one of the bigger things too and I've already seen some sort of social media action on it are these trails that they're going to build yeah. um, they have a plan to cross the Nanaimo River with a bridge so kids that were I always go back to kids because I think that's where we're you know get our strength in our community from you can have a child eventually they'll be able to come out to this intersection, come out here, bike across the river, and be at work at Sobeys in 12 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it might be, and they can do it safely. And that's the, the key, is they'll be able to do it safely. Um, I know that it's a, per if there's a mouse. There's a what? A mouse. Um, <laughs> uh, two of them. Is there two? Yeah, there's a couple in there. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. Have <laughs> we all seen it? No, $19 million facility. <laughs> 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 they got to get my... 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 <laughs> they definitely brag in their mouse circles. Oh, yeah. Hang out, right? One of the primary reasons we built this place is because we kept finding dead mice in our building. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, do have I have four questions. cats if you want. Yeah. As you brought up, like, I know it's a provincial issue, but you were talking about the advocacy or work, the work that you do with the province. But if we're going to bring people and businesses into the community, but there's no child care, mm -hmm. um, like people are going to be reluctant to come here. And I know we're in the position with both of ours that what we don't know like what to do with our kids. Right? Birth control. <laughs> Not having that more. <laughs> but um, it's like a huge barrier to young yeah. families yeah. coming here. There's we don't know where Nora's going to go to preschool, like yeah. the next. Yeah. Yeah, it is a problem. Um, 
I know there's some, it seems to be getting progressively worse and pre-primary yeah, has been yeah. Yeah. Pre-primary has decimated childcare in Nova Scotia. What about you see on TV this uh, show is called like, like Sister Wives or something. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. That is a problem. And our, our staff do advocate for the need. I got an email today from one of my staff saying, like, this is the message I'm getting from my pre-primary people. And it's sort of saying, call your counselors, call your MLAs. You know, we need to fix this problem. Um, so it, it is a topic. It's a major topic. Could the have, have a say over that? Like, could they? We don't, really. I mean, Can we, we get into it? Say, get in, say, you know, get into a bubble, something like this, because if we're talking about roads, we're talking about exactly what she said, right? Yeah. Like it's a, we have you know, one we have, infant center in uh, all of these towns, and, and none of those this. infants, like, just a, this is just like a, a microscopic view, but like, of those like 26 little babies there, all of them are now toddlers. Right. And they're still and they're in the not, spaces? And they're still in yeah, the they can't spaces. take any more new people. They can't take any more new people. There's like over 100 on the list. And they can't move to the toddler location because the preschoolers aren't moving to the yeah. school. So it's like a, a, a massive problem. We need to, like, municipality should look into a, somehow, some way, get involved into because we get into development everything, right? Yeah. And we're sure and the most, one of the most important items. Well, it, it is a topic the council has discussed fairly recently, and as I said, it's one that we're, we're, like, we're constantly advocating for and letting people know that there's a problem. Um, I'm not sure what the fix is. Yeah. But well, yeah, the, more more the provincial government, like, it has, they're kind of tying it up because the, uh, they're still in negotiations with the early childhood education, right. so they, no one's, no one's going to go. I'm going to open a daycare tomorrow right. because no one knows what's going to happen. Yeah. To the, well, and because it, the province is now subsidizing nonprofit ones, but that, not privately owned ones. Right. So no, no, no new private ones will open because that would be a dumb idea. Be yeah, yeah it'd be a dumb idea. And then, and then also the, they don't know how. Uh, and then obviously those are the ones that are subsidized, and the other ones aren't. So, so it's, it's it, there's no new ones opening for sure. Yeah. And with the development on, on the other hand, like when we're talking about like school age, kids, what are we going to do, what, what is the, I guess is it provincial or municipal that have to deal with the schools, like how are we going to accommodate all these kids in, yeah. in the education? Yeah. So, so that's interesting, we, we deal with this every time we have a development, we go to the school board and the school board's answer is former always, school board. the former school, I call it the school board, the Center for Education, and their answer is always the same. Don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll accommodate them. We'll accommodate them. One of my, um, and that's all we can get from them. One of my experience, one of my experience with my project was, when there's kids, we'll deal with it. Yeah. They yeah. won't give you an answer up, up front. Oh. <laughs> They're not going to upgrade something prior to not having it. If you have kids, don't you worry. We'll have a place for them, and we'll build something. Yeah. Like that was, you know. Like not so many years ago, they were going to shut down Maple Ridge Elementary exactly. School. Exactly, years. Five years ago. Yeah, and, and we we had to come to Jesus' moment or whatever you want to call it. That's what said. Like we showed them this. Well, we showed them this and went, "How can you? How can you even consider this?" Built two more schools. They were going to shut down one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so it is a major issue, um, and it's one that. Um, and we do have enough school. We school right now is capable of handling some of the growth. Yeah. Yeah. We have some empty classrooms in the schools. Yeah. It's not many. Yeah. In the center of this development, is, was there, I, I remember looking at it originally, like a, a business, like a small business sector to it? Like yeah, a, there's, the a block little, there. there's, there's a little block in here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's mixed okay. use. This is all line to it. We're not yeah, experiencing that problem in the rural area. Is <laughs> just a little further. Yeah, I want to go to the next door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots of room in the school. And you'll get a pie with me. Still no daycare, though. Yeah. So with things there that... There is one. There is one, but there is a way to So with things that there's, like, a real need for, like, child care or doctors, like, yeah. has council thought of anything, like, incentivizing lower property taxes for people who run at home daycares or doctors who decide to move to East Hans? So we're, we're, what we're allowed to do. Okay. Yeah, so the MGA says that we can't subsidize business, we can't subsidize private, uh, private individuals. We just we just can't. Yeah, it's um, a hand tied at the provincial level. Right, then. the province can. So they can do payroll taxes and they can do um, 
you know, those types of things, but we just, we don't have that ability to, uh, for obvious reasons. We don't have deep pockets. Like, we just don't have the money that those kind of programs take. But for doctors, for example, council does have, they've done a doctor recruitment video that the recruiters at the provincial level can use to take to doctors that they're trying to bring these TANs. So we paid to have that done and, and did that. Um, and we do have some contingency money in our budget in case they need something else to help bring doctors into East Ham. So um, I've gone out for dinners with doctors, for example, and, and told them about the community and told them, you know, what they could expect if they come to live and practice here. So those types of things are ongoing, but it's the provincial recruiters that we work with. We don't work directly with the doctors, but we want to sell our community. Mm -hmm. Right? So selling our community are things like look at our business community, look at our residents, we're young, mm -hmm. you won't come here and, and you know, so see a, a demographic that you don't want to treat, you get young families and whatnot. And those are all important things to doctors, whether they should or shouldn't be. Um, mm -hmm. But we do have a very young community which is attractive to doctors, mm -hmm. also to young families who don't have daycare. Mm -hmm. so. Or usually doctors. <laughs> Four. Um, so this is the FH development um, proposal for um, Elmsdale, and this was approved in April of 2022. So again, the same idea, you've got your different densities of development um, as you move through the subdivision. The yellow is your single family homes. This one has more sort of single family homes towards the, the Elmwood subdivision. Um, pink would be your semis in the middle and the back. Um, and then your blue are your townhouses, and then of course your orange is your multi-unit up by the highway. This is the 102, and this is the number two. So again, when they get this development going, it's gonna be quite a significant change for Elmsdale, but it will have all that connectivity for trails and, and parks. There's also, yeah, there's green space in there as well. There's one other development uh, for FH development that is underway right now. It's under consideration. Um, on the other side of that Armco development, there's a long stretch of land that FH has an active development on. If you want to see the details and participate in the public process, you can look at it on our website. Uh, we just had the public information meeting last week. Uh, yes, it was the last week. Before. Two weeks ago. It was the last week. Yeah. And then you'll have sort of that next public process of reports going to council and a public hearing where the difference between a public information meeting is when the public can come and get information that's very informal. A public hearing is when it's in front of council and you can actually express to council how you feel about the development, whether you're for it or against it or what concerns you have. So if you have concerns about traffic or whatever, you can come and, um, and ask those questions there. I'm sorry, where exactly is this entire future? So this one, here's Robert Scott Drive, right? Uh, Robert Scott is... Right around here somewhere. No, Robert Scott's right here. Yeah. Here. So here's so, Robert Scott Drive. So okay. this is the... So it's drive, beyond Robert Scott. Beyond Robert Scott Drive. Okay. Yeah. okay. And, so, then, and what's kind of in, in uh, muted there, that's the Aaron Co. That's the Aaron Co. Okay. that's been approved. Yeah. And this one's under consideration. So what you'll see is when you get all these developments coming in, our plan and engineering staff make sure that all the connectivity for roads and pipes and whatnot works. When was the meeting for this one again? The public information meeting was last week. Um, and then the public hearing will be sort of summer-ish probably? Um, fall? Probably September. Yeah. yeah, so if you follow our Facebook page, um, if you go on our website <laughs> and you, currently you know, um, and you go on to, there's an active applica there's an application section. You go in there, all these applications are there, and you can see all the staff reports. You can see the developer submissions, everything's there. And we're actually creating a new section there for all the site plans that have been approved. Okay. So all these individual apartment buildings you're seeing being built in Enfield and Elmsdale, um, they don't necessarily go through a process like this. So, you know, sometimes people are surprised uh, when they see them. So we're, all that information is going to be on our website as well. Uh, there were some changes recently in the mixed-use zone, uh, mixed-use center zone in Elmsdale. So um, this zone along the number two, you'll see it's sort of uh, from the Magnolia up through uh, Elmsdale. Uh, some changes recently were that in the whole section, you now have to have at least 50% commercial on the bottom of your building when you build it. 
um, just to make sure that we continue to have an inventory of, of commercial space available. And um, in this small section down here, um, it's now limited to three stories as far as development uh, goes. So all of the um, blue buildings and the yellow buildings have already been um, applied for and don't fall into the new rules. They would fall into the That's old rules. picture, though, Kim. Pardon? That's the old picture. It's missing a few more applications. Okay. So this is what I have at the time. Lena would know. Inside school. Inside school. <laughs> I only work in the building around the joint. <laughs> Um, the other application the council is looking at right now is a 70 unit independent living facility to be added to the Magnolia site. So those of you who have aging parents who are typically sending them off to be somewhere else because we don't have that type of facility here, we're, we're hoping that um, it's under consideration now. So It's been approved. Oh, has it? It's been approved. <laughs> so you don't pay attention. <laughs> Um, and then we also have a fairly big development in um, cottage country in the villages of Long Lake, so that's Mount Unia. Um, so a massive subdivision there, 401 dwellings, um, and that's just one of the bigger things in Mount Uniac. There's lots of smaller subdivision applications coming in for Mount Uniac now. So all of that to say that We have an anticipated 5,000 residential units by 2033 that we have to plan for. Um, and we have a demand for additional 24, uh, 240,000 square feet of commercial uh, projected by 2033. So that, folks, is East Hands in a nutshell for 2023. Um, a lot of information. Um, we do have a few minutes left for questions, although we've been fairly interactive as we went, but... Um, One of the questions I really had is, you showed us our municipality is set up and stuff like this. Where are we compared, like, comparison to other municipalities? Where do we stay? Are we, like, in a... Size-wise? Uh, no, no, I'm talking, like, financial and development and, and like, is our municipality, I understood last time I asked you, we had debt, right? We're in yep. debt. And if, what's our debt? Is it... Steep debt is a little bit, is that number are we allowed to know as a public? Um, yeah, I don't know the exact number. But roughly. Um, the way the province uh, measures municipalities and their fiscal health and, and their health overall, um, they have a bunch of indexes that they use. We are um, above board in every index except for one, and that is one where. Um, because we use reserves so much, okay. they don't account for people using their reserves as much as we do. So it kind of throws off the index okay, um, a little good. bit. To me, it's a good thing. Yeah. So what we will do is if, and we also don't do projects just for the sake of doing them. <coughs> so if council says they're gonna do a project and bring money in from reserves, the province looks at the money we're gonna spend, but they don't account for the money we're bringing in from reserves. Okay. So we kind of, fall short because they don't account for the $500,000 we might be bringing in to do that project. The other thing is if we have a project in our budget that we don't do for some reason, then they consider that we've missed our mark, we've missed our target because we didn't spend the money we said we were going to spend. Mm. To me, it's good. It's good, yeah. right? So, and we're not red on that. So they go green, yellow, and red. We're not red on anything. Um, the yellow is that those indexes that we don't, um, you know. How much money do we have? I don't know the number off the top of my head. Question? Um, so earlier you mentioned the disposable surplus property. Where can I find out more information for that? Uh, it's too early it's too for early. information yet. Yep. That's just a project that we're, once so we started. So that will be put on the Facebook page? Yeah, oh yeah. Like, once we start it, it'll be. And you'll see the odd property now. Yeah. If something comes up and, you know. So as community groups are asking us to take over their buildings because they're they're done with them, yeah. the municipality looks at those and says we don't need it for whatever reason, uh -huh. we're going to declare it yeah. surplus. Yeah. So you'll see expressions of interest come out on those buildings every once in a while, but the massive project of getting rid of all the little odds yeah. and sods, you'll know when that happens. Yeah. If you follow us on social media, you'll, you'll know.
Kim, did the community center in Shuby get picked up by a not-for-profit? Um, we got an expression of interest, and that was just yesterday, but I can't remember yeah. what motion was made out of council. Yeah, let's, uh, I'm trying to remember where we're at in the process. Let's just say we had one expression of interest on the building. Yeah. Okay. So, from a community group. So we'll have to work through. Yeah, it's a public process from this point on. Yeah. I think I probably know who. Yeah. There's a public hearing. Oh, Anytime yeah. we sell property okay. for less than market value, we have to, to a, to a nonprofit group, we have yeah. to go through a public hearing. So again, it'll be a public process to go through that. Um, and I have another question. When you were talking about the taxes on the, um, or the area rate for the arena, yep. you talked talked about the, um, I think you said three million that we put into it at the time. Yep. And that was why the area rate was um, applied. Yep. Is there a time that that area rate will change or decrease or? Well, it just went up by a cent. Yeah. Uh, because when we took over the building, there was some significant costs that had to be picked up. Yeah. Um, the Arena Association had fallen behind on paying for some significant mm -hmm. events, like when the dome collapsed. Yes. Um, there was a roof that needed to be repaired. There was some ice plant work. So we picked up all of those expenses when we took over the building. So it went up to four cents. And is it only the the people in the area that are paying for in those area rates that are paying? That I can't yeah. remember. It's, it's the so, old districts that were in yes. place in nineteen yeah, right. nine two thousand. And none of the other districts, even none though the municipality them. now owns that building, no. um, have any fiscal responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a gen there is one. There's a ten thousand dollar allotment that, as part of the dealings way back when. Um, they said, well, the municipality should pay something towards it because there's a few people for Roger who use it or a few people for Gore. So there is this little $10,000 allocation we do, but <laughs> part of the problem, for all and intents part purposes, of the whole thing at the time is, for example, Hockey Nova Scotia tells you where your kid can play hockey. Right. Yeah. And if you're living in Rodden, your kid's not playing hockey at sports, but your own Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, they, they prescribe that unless you lie about your address. Yeah. <laughs> So I've got some uh, some prizes. We can keep asking questions as I pull numbers here. Thank you for all of that information. I'll see if I can and just wind down and sleep wind up, <laughs> <laughs> Before we wind up, I'd just like to say that we couldn't do any of what gets done here without our exceptional staff. Yeah. Um, council makes the policies. And sometimes council butts heads with staff. But <laughs> we have, yeah, far enough, the best staff in the province, in my opinion. Yeah, no question. We did dealt with other municipalities, and I can vote for that. Yeah. yeah. I go to conferences, and uh, I have, I don't even remember who it was from somewhere else in the province, waylaid me in the hallway of the conference and said, You're from East Hands. Yes, I am. You know what you've got in Kim Ramsey. You people should give her a raise. <laughs> I did not pay him to say that. <laughs> but no, our staff is, uh, I think, well respected here, and they're well respected province wide. Yeah, as it should be.